Welcome to Ask the Expert on Contingent Workforce Strategies LinkedIn Group. And man, I am so excited about the conversation today and for many, many reasons. One, the chap that I have here is one of my favorite people in the industry. We always have the best conversations. We've had a lot of good times over the years and he is just so full of great ideas and information and we've got an unbelievable topic um and then secondly the, the topic today is incredible and it's something that is really needed to be talked about in the trends towards remote work globalization of our talent pools and the idea of fraud proof hiring redefining identity and competency management and assessments in the for the modern workforce and it's really starting to think about assessing people and understanding who you're working with um, versus just looking at a resume like the old way of hiring people that resume these days is great it's a good starter but you want to get past the resume because chat gpt can write them for you and then working remotely, somebody else can show up to the job versus the interview. And so there's a lot of issues in the market today around that. And I've got Ben Walker here today to talk about the fraud proofing your hiring and really doing better assessments around who you're working with and identity management and assessing competencies in the workforce. So Ben, I know, you know, thank you for coming on and I'll give you a quick bio intro. Ben has over 25 years of experience in the contingent and the human capital space. He comes from the management consulting space, staffing. He's, you know, stood up some of the largest MSP programs. He was at Brightfield uh, in their consulting practice and technology group as, as they launched the TDX products. He was on the buy side even um, at Bloomberg. And now he is the COO of Glider dot ai a uh, online human capital assessments and identity management system so ben i know you're going to talk about glider better than i will but thank you thank you for taking some time out of your day to talk to me oh it's such a pleasure jeff i've seen so many of these videos and i'm it's, it's an honor to be a part of it and and as you read through my bio it makes me realize why i have so much gray hair now as i'm looking at uh, myself in the, in the in the view here but uh thank you i'm really excited to be here we're all young at heart we're all <laughs> that's right and just well, yes. experienced we're just yes. experienced it's not about Seen. age it's experience and wisdom <laughs> <laughs> that's right and, and just before we, I'll, I'll give you a little overview of glider but i want to yeah. say for, for for your viewers you are the only person i know whose real background is nicer and more tranquil than the, the than the green screen fake backgrounds that's real <laughs> folks <laughs> okay that's, i'll that's... do one of these i can actually <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Real stuff. Um, awesome. Well, so let me, yes. Yeah, so for those who aren't familiar with Glider, I'll be really succinct. So you covered really the two elements more than anything else. It used to be, can you do what you say you can do through your resume uh, specifically? Now it's, are you who you say you are? And can you do what you say you can do? And it's that identity management that, that sadly I'll say we have to put a lot of focus on. And We'll get into more of that detail, but we refer to ourselves as a skill validation platform. That's still core to our mission. And then making sure you are who you say you are as a sort of necessary evil or secondary, but critical part of that. And so we have a platform. It's a SaaS based software solution. You can turn on the different products that you need, but our product was built and designed around the recruiting process or the recruiting funnel. So we've got product products for you know, mass outreach to candidates um, was just at a supplier conference earlier this week. And they talked about the challenge of hundreds or thousands of candidates flooding a, a rec or a job posting. How do you go through that beyond just uh, resume matching? We've got we've got products that will automate that outreach to candidates and validate things for you. Um, our assessments is is sort of core, rich, deep competency um, validation. 
We've got a live interview product. We've got products for learning. So for employee upskilling, reskilling certification. So we run the gamut um, uh, all all in the interest of um, making the jobs of hiring managers and recruiters easy and more efficient uh, and more consistent as they're screening candidates. Yeah. And it's interesting kind of the take you have on that because it really gets towards the idea of identity management and skills assessment, right? And skills assessment platform, like you say. And, you know, I was just on uh, a discussion with John Windsor, who wrote the book, Open Talent. And he's really um, keen on understanding some of the obstacles and the trends in, in the future of work and how things are going. And one of the things that we talked about was the whole idea of total talent management, I think, is going to be here. Um, with the new trend towards, you know, this whole idea of um, remote work where your talent pools are global. And so you say, okay, if I'm engaging a talent pool that's FTEs and full-time, I've got access to contract talent on an hourly basis or as individuals, I can outsource it to a company. You know, I, I can now use AI bots to do some of the work. And so the whole idea yeah. of total talent management is potentially here where you can outsource and find a optimized talent mix of those kind of engagement models. But you got to go back to what does each talent pool bring to the table with the skills to complete a task of work. And so I think, you know, when looking at that trend, it's, but how do you do that? And I think, you know, when I think of it, there's these skills assessments to be able to start to inventory the the competencies of your workforce, no matter the engagement model is so key to then be able to optimize that to make the decision moving forward with how you're going to get a particular project done. So, you know, I think some of those trends that we see in the market, you're well ahead of them in, in providing some of the tools there. But, you know, beyond the trends we're here and now why why are some of the drivers what are primary drivers behind why customers and organizations are looking more at identity management and skills assessments yeah there's um there's sort of a a few key ones that we hear and see most often and and I'll borrow the, the four dimensions that fr- from my friends at Brightfield that we used to talk about, quality, efficiency, cost, and risk, it all sort of, that's the core of everything that we do is to address those, those four dimensions. Um, so, and that applies here. So from a quality perspective, one of the primary reasons that we hear from a quality perspective, or one of the primary things we hear is, um, I used to rely on the resume and you you touched on this. The resume was the thing we could rely on for where has this person been? What have they done? What achievements um, have they accomplished? And, you know, LinkedIn became a thing that helped you validate a resume and comparing those. But today you can create a new resume tailored to a job description through AI in about 30 seconds. So I'll, I'll use the other example I heard, at least one more example, and there may be others during our conversation from this, this uh, conference I was at earlier this week. They saw that about 40 resumes that they received were virtually identical. They all seemingly used the, you know, you take a job description, you run it through a model and it spits out a resume. They're like, this is really odd. So, so that's a thing and it's pervasive. And then you can, of course, create a LinkedIn profile that back up, backs up your, you can have as many LinkedIn profiles as you want, may not have that validated check, but I'm sure there are ways around that that I'm not even aware of. But that's, so, so what happens is they rely on that to make shortlisting decisions and interview decisions. So they found a high proportion of candidates are interviewing clearly did not have that experience. They did not have, more importantly, just the competency. So you can use a resume to say, well, you were at this company and you you did these things, you get into the deep competency questions and they couldn't answer the most fundamental questions. So that's a big driver from a quality perspective and just process efficiency is another one. Um, there's something in this space called job validity. You have to evaluate candidates on on the right set of cr- criteria on the role on the requirements for the role. Yeah. Sometimes you have easy graders. You have hiring managers who are like, oh, I just want to, you know, find somewhere I'm a good fit with. Uh, don't worry, I'm sure you have the technical expertise. Then you have others who come up with these crazy 
ways of evaluating technical competency that have nothing to do with the role that they're in. So there's this inconsistency of rigor of evaluation across companies, and they want to get a handle on that. And then the third one is the, is the one that really is the fastest call to action, and that is this cheating and impersonation. So, yeah. oh my gosh, we just found out that someone that we brought in and, and engaged, either for a contingent position or an employee position, is not the person that we talked to throughout this process. And that creates unbelievable risk. Um, yeah. and, and so those are the primary reasons why people come to us. So it really crosses those, those dimensions. Um, probably the cost is the last, the last driver of those four quality, efficiency, cost, and risk, but there's still some cost components in there as well. I'm overpaying for this resource who has a title because they're based on seniority. They've been doing this for a while, but they're really not even as good as someone that I could hire that has less experience. And so I'm overpaying for what I need. Yeah, it, it's really interesting, though, like the it, and it almost is like I think we've talked about the word fraud and cheating a lot in this in this that's come up and you don't want to call anybody a fraud or a cheater because there's different levels of experience. But it it's amazing how now the tools that are out there to help people give confidence to lie on their resume or flower up their resume and then say that they can do something when they can't clearly can't makes it almost yeah. impossible. So it, it part of this too, with the global talent pools that we have, yes, you often never actually meet each other. Pandemic proved that how many okay. times did we hire people over the pandemic that, you know, it was three years later, you actually met them after the pandemic was done and you're right. like, Oh, you're, you're shorter or taller than, than <laughs> I expected. <That's> right. <laughs> but this is happening constantly, especially within the contingent workforce where the gigs are in and out. Yeah. And and people are maybe more uh confident in their ability to, to get something done, get cash out of the project, and then yeah. they're moving on and they won't get caught. So right. they're a little bit more um I hate to say it, but confident and yeah. ability to just, hey, let's go do this. So, you know. Yeah more and more companies i think there's example after example and we all kind of laugh about it but there's a cost to that there's a risk to that as the yeah. driver so no it's interesting so you know we talked about the trying to address and prevent candidate cheating and this fraud as one of the drivers um can you elaborate on some ex specific examples like uh, you know, I think there are examples out in the market, but you've as yeah. a focused on this, it'd be very interesting to hear some of the case cases that organizations have um, had incidents where either you've helped them or they're buying your product now because of the incidences they've, yeah. they've encountered. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you some specific examples and they vary from sort of maybe you and I, you know, news, you know, you're, you, you can develop software. I can't, I'm, I want to apply for this job. Can you be my proxy? Can you go through the process as informal and sort of one off as that all the way to incredibly sophisticated, deliberate operations to pool resources and to sort of spoof throughout the process um, all of the screening activity. And so, um, and really, you, I just want to reiterate your point that COVID, like so many other things, it was the inflection point. So suddenly overnight, all work and screening activities was remote. And so it opened the door for people to, to be anywhere in the world virtually to say, yeah, I think I can, I can get myself into that job no matter where it is. So we see, we do see lots of people having someone else take the test for them. That's the that's the really the primary way of of the primary cheating that we see. And our system has all these optional proctoring features. If you turn them all on, it's going to flag things like this candidate's not in control of their machines. Somebody else is is in control of their machine, or they're using um, you know external sources. Uh, they're moving out of the test area, looking up something, copy pasting. We can detect all that voices in the background. One one silly example I'll give you. It's silly to me because I can't believe that they did this. Is they forget they have to agree to share their microphone, and we can hear what they're saying through the monitoring report of the test. And the the candidate was asking the questions out loud, and then some voice from somewhere else was answering the questions. I was like, dude. <laughs> so that's a that's one example. But let me tell you about like the worst case, right? I want to focus on like what's the extreme. 
And we've been reading about this, hearing about it anecdotally. We, there's newspaper, newspaper articles written about this. But it, it hit it hit us very recently where this is you wouldn't believe it if you, if you if you didn't read some of these articles and I can tell you that this is real. There is a, a um, initiative by the North Korean government to create these these remote laptop farms. Arizona is is one of them that got in the news recently where North Korean nationals are using someone else's identity. And in the particular case we had is a stolen identity to get through the initial screening process. Um, they would, they would in some cases take our test, but using someone else's identity. And um, they in fact were you know, not in Phoenix, Arizona. They were in North Korea. They get assigned to the project. They work on the project. The money that they generate for themselves is passed back to the to the North Korean government for their weapons program. I kid you not. Google it. Yeah. You will read about articles well, and, of it. And I don't disbelieve that because, quite honestly, you, as you know, my history at, at People 2.0, I'm very much into the employer of record payroll industry, and I lead um, uh, HR.com's global alliance around employer of record. One of the number one issues amongst the employer of records these days is fraud and and they're and it's huge issue because yeah. guess what employment payroll and what the wages to workers are is a massive amount of money sure. so as someone hires someone puts you know it used to put them on um the books of an employer of record you pay the worker you give terms well guess what if that's a fake company and this person is a fake person, you've just paid out $20,000 to a candidate that's gone with your 20 K yeah. to a fake. And then you're trying to receive the money from a fake company. Right. And guess what? There, some of these payroll companies that are just entering into the market are getting crushed with bad debt because of this, mm -hmm. because they aren't doing the due diligence on the company and or yeah. the candidates before they're bringing them through that employment payroll process. And so I, you know, as you talk about this and you've seen em other employers getting caught in this kind of web, the employer of records are in the same boat. It's a whole dynamic I hadn't even considered, but yeah, another really massive impact to them. So this, so this hit our platform, all, our platform, because the proctoring was turned on, had all these these flags being raised, uh, literally a red exclamation point on the candidate's monitoring report. Um, and so fast forward, the, the FBI got involved and they were they were just thrilled to have the image of this person, um, the ID that they'd uh, of yeah. the person they didn't they'd, they'd stolen. Um, they had video and audio of this person. So it became um, a, a source of information that they needed in their investigation. So that's really the worst case example, not trying to scare anybody, but um, the fact that it now has, is, you know, we, we've seen it. Um, and that's really the worst case scenario you're, you're trying to, you're trying to um, prevent. Yeah. It's interesting because you're just trying to get work done. Right. And, and so you think, okay, Awesome. Remote work is fantastic and we can just hire people to get work done, but you're not understanding some of the behind the scenes consequences that are happening as yeah. and how you're getting taken advantage of because of that. So yeah, exactly. thinking about, you know, putting proper tools in place and uh, be it skills assessments, identity management, employment and law compliance issues, vetting that before you engage workers now and engage talent is so essential because the consequences like that can all come back to you reputationally. You, yeah. you might not have the right workers to get the work done either. Um, you may be out the capital and the cash flow of it. So there's a lot of consequences that add up if yeah. you don't do some of this upfront due diligence. IP and network security risk. If this resource is now given access to your network and they're there for nefarious reasons, who knows what could happen? Yeah, no, it's it's actually very interesting how this has evolved from just a talent assessment into yeah. security and risk management tools as yeah. well, right? 
I, yeah. So we, and I'll tell you, we'll give you one, one other anecdote about this. And that, I, I love to hear from recruiters. And so I was at another uh, one of our customers with a group of their recruiters listening to how they use it and getting their feedback. But one said he he um, he estimates about 80 percent of the candidates that he screens are cheating. So he said, I, I'm, I'm sort of this forensic analyst now, in addition to being a recruiter, um, he, he uses our monitoring tools to look for the obvious ways that get flagged by our system, but even some more subtle um, ways that they cheat in the monitoring report you can look for. So um, it is pervasive. Yeah, it's interesting. So are there any particular jobs that you're seeing this happen? You know, I, ultimately, right off the top of my head, I think IT, but is there other yeah. areas that you're seeing? It is primarily, by far, primarily IT roles, I think, because the stakes are higher, the money's higher. Um, the demand is, is such that the volume has been so high that I feel like that it, sort of the calculus in their mind is like, I'll be able to get my way through. They're flooded and overwhelmed with the hiring process. Um, we see it in other areas. So we do um, not, not to that extreme. Normally it's, or generally it's way, during the test an individual trying to find ways to cheat for things uh, like, you know, customer service roles or um, uh, non non technical roles as well, but it's primarily technology. So we we map all this and we we catalog it and we actually have a heat map so we can see where in the country is this most pervasive, what types of roles is it most pervasive, and so um, you know it's a big issue in the U.S. It's a big issue in India, and then we see interesting things in the data, like in in Dallas, Texas, for some reason in the U.S. That's where we we've, we've seen a much higher percentage of uh, cheating d detected through our platform than other places. So, you know, we're 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 primarily a, a, a transactional system trying to make a process easier and more effective and efficient. But we've got rich data set and analytics now. We're thinking about ways that we can use that to inform um, our customers of, of of certain things that might impact where they find talent or how they look for talent and things like that. But um, yeah, it's primarily. Well, what has been really interesting that is the evolution to as you talked about the product. The evolution to assessing skills, but then also potentially upskilling skills. Yes. And so, you know, I like the idea of that, you know, identity management and integrity is building character. And I've always, as just a general philosophy, thought about hire for character, you can teach some of the skills, right? And so can you start to utilize this to make sure, hey, listen, we're going to ask you some questions. If you don't know, don't cheat, right? Yeah, and, if they, right. and then that way you're hiring, you're helping them understand that I'm assessing you for, for character as right. much as your skills. And with that, listen, we've also got modules and or at the end of the assessments, it's helping employers understand what you're good at and what you're not, and maybe you may need training on, on some of these areas that you need. That's so right. moving into that talent management side of it and upskilling workers and the evolution of the product has been really interesting. Like, what what are your, your examples of some of that with employers? I think that is a fascinating area, especially given the skill shortage. I know, you know, we're yep. in a down cycle of the economy, that's one thing. But in reality, yep. we still are massively undersourced and don't we have a skill shortage and so strategically thinking about your talent retraining your talent for the work that they the future of where you're going to need these folks is important and what are you seeing some of the evolution there yeah we've seen a lot more attention for a couple of the reasons that you mentioned specifically is that that skill shortage um, when hiring freezes started to happen, hiring slowdowns, particularly in financial services and then in tech where it was like the sky's the limit and suddenly we can't hire anymore, we well, can't fall behind. So um, we've, we've had companies originally coming to us purely for talent acquisition come to us for the talent management and the learning and the upskilling so that we couple our um, assessments with a learning curriculum. Uh, in many cases, or it just might be that we want to offer our employees the opportunity to um, go through an assessment and do a baseline. So I might be a full stack Java developer and I can, you know, I'm, I'm full stack, but I really started more on the back end and, and, and my job Java's proficient, my front end, not so much. Um, you can take a baseline test 
get training in any number of ways and then take a second test and prove that you now have the skills that you need. So we're closing skill gaps for enterprises. Recruitment agencies are also using it. So they have, they've got their candidates they use again and again. They almost become a bit of a bench. They're, they're using them across many different customers over time. And I'll use that Java full stack developer example again. Maybe they're a backend developer and they're proficient in Java, but we could make a lot more money and the, the demand is really in full stack Java developers. They're putting them through the front end training and then um, having them take a glider test to say to their to their customer, look, they now are highly proficient yeah. in full stack roles. Let's consider them for this full stack role that before they they couldn't be considered for. So you're you're keeping them utilized. You're you're upping their their bill rate. You're increasing profitability for your company. So those are some of the two primary drivers. The last one is certification. We're seeing a lot more in certification. So we have one customer that has um, their resources are customer facing, providing advice to their customers to complement the software product they have. They cannot be customer facing. They cannot interact with a customer until they. They pass one or in some cases, many different glider assessments. And so one exciting one we're working on right now is an AI certification. Um, we just keep hearing from our customers. Do you have anything around AI proficiency and prompt engineering? So we've formalized an AI certification program and um, had a lot of initial real, really positive um, feedback about that and expect that to take off. Oh, yeah. And I think there'll always be an evolution of what you're asked to um, yeah. assess, right? Uh, but getting back to the, those macro trends of, yeah. hey, we have a skill shortage. We have a global workforce that's remote. And we want to be able to inventory the skills and certify the people, not just by the resume anymore, but by a competency test. Yes. That then says, yes, they have the skills so that, and they, and or even in some case better, they don't have the skills. So you're not wasting time with them or you're yeah. upskilling them prior to engaging them to projects versus yeah. engaging the projects that they don't have the skills to do. Exactly. And then they're trying to learn on the job and that costs everybody money and time. So I think it's, it's really optimizing that whole idea of talent management. And, you know, I envision a future that, once again, going back to here's all of our talent pools and the different ways they're engaged, be it full-time, be it contract, be it independent contractor, freelancer, be it statement of work engaged workers. And then this idea of synthetic or AI driven kind of automated labor, robot labor as well. And AI coming on top to say, okay, if they've got all these, all this talent is assessed properly, and there's a you know apples to apples comparison testing, then based on cost and apples to apples skills assessments, you should have 30% FTE. You can outsource this one versus use yeah. contractors that you're gonna have to manage, et cetera, et cetera. Or, you know, oh, and you could probably use 10% synthetic labor and then that's the optimum resource mix that is yeah. total talent management absolutely yeah i can see a time when large enterprises are incorporating this into their strategy going into new markets going into new areas uh new new um you know, um, new markets geographically, but also new new industries or business areas that complement their existing. As they expand, having this decision support to know, well, what, how ready are we? You know, readiness to accomplish a strategy um, with all this distilled information down from the, you know, Ben Walker has this skills profile and, and Jeff Nugent has this skills profile, aggregating it uh, in the organization to say, are we ready to do that strategy? Yeah. What do we need for a workforce preparedness? Should we build? Should we buy? And, you know, however you categorize that true decision support to execute on strategy, which is something that's talked about. But we're, you know, in this in this world that you and I both live in, the day to day operational block blocking and tackling and the, the tactical stuff can, can be overwhelming. But we're seeing the results of all that great work that practitioners are implementing and the solutions they're implementing starting to bubble up into true decision support. No, it's amazing. So, you know, what's next uh, in, in the glider world, but think of it more in the assessments, identity management, where do you yep. see things heading in terms of um, the industry trends in terms of, and probably that will drive the evolution of your product as well. 
Yeah, yeah, I know you'll be shocked by this. Uh, we're we're embracing AI. Uh, we're adopting AI. <laughs> it's in our name. Everyone's adopting AI. But yeah, no, we are aggressively, I will say, incorporating AI in our approaches. It's optional and off by default because lots of organizations start to get a little skittish when you start hearing about use of, of AI. But enabling more of our products with AI to make things happen faster and more consistent, making the job of a recruiter easier, not replacing a recruiter, giving them increased decision support. So that's one um, element. And then on the ID verification, um, we've got some integrations that you'll be hearing about soon in the onboarding process. That's the full, sort of final step. We're typically involved in pre-hiring when we're used for talent acquisition. And then and then you can use our information, like is this person who took this assessment the same as who showed up for our interview? But then they go to onboarding and that's where there's a lot of disconnect. If the person who actually shows up has nothing to do with what happened upstream. Um, so integration with an, with an onboarding platform gotcha. to do that last sort of mile of ID verification. And then, and then also um, just a true certification that I am who I say I am. Um, and, and that I'm a real human. Um, so, you know, there's lots of solutions out there now that you know, whether it's just, you know, LinkedIn, now you can go through a process. Yeah, get a clear that, process. Yeah. I am, yeah. I am. But having that, having that be more portable across anything that you do so that I can prove I am who I am. So if any fraud comes up, if someone has stolen my identity, it's much easier to prove I am who I am who I am. I'm, I'm not that person who stole my identity, but also so that giving the enterprises the assurance um, through a formalized way that, you know, that person you're talking to really is who they say they are. Yeah. So, you know, I, we can talk forever and ever and ever, but I know, you know, when we talk futuristic and you've brought the future into a technology platform that does a lot of assessments and plugs into a lot of, let's call it ports of somebody's laptop, it's facial recognition, it's all of these things. Um, you know, the idea of legal comes into it around yeah. EEOC and employment equity law, these types yeah. of things, privacy laws. You, you've probably heard this uh, before uh, as you've built out the product and, and been successful in working with legal teams at large global organizations. What are, you know, what are some of those obstacles that you've, you've bumped into and how does yeah. a program overcome that? Uh, and two-part question, and I'll ask it again if you don't answer it, um, change management of that. So what are the obstacles yeah. around the legal side of things? Yes. And then and then also the obstacle of change management in, hey, you're going to be assessing candidates in a very rigorous manner. That's different than the old resume and the slappy on the back. Let's have a coffee kind of conversation interview. Yeah. So yeah. can we talk about those two? And, and yeah, interesting. Going? You touched on the two two reasons why every time we show, you know, for our continued workforce program solution, which is a very specialized solution for the ecosystem, we show it to people. We have never had someone say, eh, it's okay. Or, eh, oh, you know, they're blown away. They're really impressed by it. But then you get to gates, right? And one of the gates is legal compliance. So we preemptively, preemptively developed a document we send that's really everything that they might need to know. So we'll say, look, you might not know that you're going to have to answer these questions, but it is things around in the U.S. It's ADA compliance and the ability to um, to request um, an accommodation and not take the test the way it is. It's all of the rules that are popping up nationally and within states in the U.S. around use of AI and responsible use of AI. And it centers around transparency, compliance, and then the, the, the limited use of that once you're done using that information for its purpose, purging it. So we use, um, we use a number of things as, as guideposts. So GDPR is a great guidepost yeah. for us. We sort of looked at it. So it reminds me back in the day when selling selling SaaS solutions and, and being asked about information security, we always point to Germany. Germany has the most rigorous rules. We can tell you that we can comply with Germany's rules. Then they're like, cool, we can go anywhere. Yeah. So we use, we use um, GDPR as a guidepost, but there's lots of state legislative uh, activity right now. And 
but it, the common theme is all is all of this. So we we have built all that in the transparency. We have to get consent to do this, and the acceptable use and the purging of that data. Um, those and so we so we've developed really comprehensive documentation to give to them to say. This is these are the types of people who are going to come asking about these questions. It has radically reduced the time from the first, wow, that looks amazing, let's do it, to getting it done. Yeah. Um, and it's also just increased the percentage of those organizations that say, yeah, that looks amazing, and, and they do get it done. Change management is the other one. I have run a, a contingent workforce program as an MSP yeah. provider. I have overseen one as a buyer. It, it can be highly transactional. We get set into the ways that we do things and this introduces something new into the ecosystem. And so you know, there's su suppliers are impacted, candidates are impacted, the hiring managers are impacted. So we do um, these very structured information sessions for all the key stakeholders. So we have value proposition to the candidate, value proposition to the hiring manager, value proposition to the recruiter and selling them on the, the impact. We have data that, that we also start with now in our presentations. Here's the results. We have the metrics, the quality and efficiency metrics from implementing glider, pre-glider, post-glider, or with glider, without glider, if they're not yeah. using it everywhere. That tells a, a lot of great stories and that helps get people to say, okay, I need to get up that change curve. But we've, through communication and re recurring communication, repeated information sessions, uh, making sure everyone's really, yes, it's changing. Yes, there may be some negative consequences. Yes, you have to ask these candidates to do something they didn't have to do before, but here's the value of doing it. And then here's the impact. Here's the value yeah. overall to the program that we've seen. So those are the two approaches we're taking for, for those two topics. No, and that it's so important because I think the change management when a program lead in our space is getting feedback like, oh, another, I just want to hire somebody quick. Well, yeah. if it's creating efficiencies, we have the data that it will create more efficiencies for you and you get better results on quality at the end of the day. This is why we're doing this. And we're eliminating that candidate fraud and cheating out of the process that actually creates huge risk for the organization if you're seen funding a terrorist organization or organized crime or something like that too, right? Yeah. So yeah, um, when you kind of put it that way, then the managers are on board and Quite honestly, the, the good talent will do the right things too and follow through the process. And yeah. if you can al also understand, like have the the folks understand that, hey, this is part of our process to cut some of this stuff out that is ag was taking your jobs before that. So if you're the right candidate and you've got the right skills, you will get through this process and, and will help you look better as, as, a, as a candidate because you'll have our certifications behind you, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of our, our mantras is make make hiring fair and opportunity uh, accessible. Um, yeah. And that resonates throughout what we do. Well, yeah, and I, I, we can go on and on, so I'll cut it off. But I just think yes. on a global basis, how it democratizes knowledge. If you, yeah, if you were in Africa, you might not be able to work at a, a, you know, a finance job in Manhattan. But if you had the knowledge to do so and you're found and you can meet the thresholds of the, the testing, why not take that job in Manhattan and work for a prestigious company? So I think it's an amazing thing um, to be able to do and start to level set skills versus, you know, the handshake back, back yep. slapping kind of yep. network, right? That yep. uh, has been always there. Our other thing is competency over credentials. And, you know, if you don't need a, a college degree to be a, the best software developer in the world, then why ask for a college degree and, and prove that you're the best software developer in the world by taking this test and, as you said, democratizing that whole process and, and an objective measure by which you can say, I am the best software developer in the world here. <laughs> No, that's amazing. So Ben, thank you for your time. It's been yeah, amazing talking to you on the topic, getting to know more about Glider and the cool tools that you're bringing to market. Uh, and just once again, your experience in this marketplace is uh, second to none. So I appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Nuj. I appreciate it. It's great to see you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.